in the full brightness of a summer moon, Abdul Baha arrived on Friday, August 30th, accompanied by two interpreters. And as he entered the home of some Baha'is on Pine Avenue, many watched from neighboring windows to catch the first glimpse of this white robed majestic figure who they lovingly called the Persian prophet and whose advent had been so eloquently heralded through the press. The following morning, Saturday, August 31st, Abdul Baha's arrival was again widely featured in the leading newspapers. From that hour, people flocked to his presence in ever increasing numbers, the great search of humanity for guidance, for happiness, for peace and assurance amidst the troubled conditions of the world. And none came in vain. The combined impression of his presence and his words was profound. One newspaper later pictured the moving scene the crowd, Abdul Baha, a serene, majestic figure, calm, commanding, austere, and wise. His audience was held in a spell of wonder and amazement. Even when Abdul Baha had finished speaking, the people would not go and lingered on asking question after question, so satisfied and tranquilized by his replies that many of them followed him later to his room. In the Unitarian Church, where he first spoke, has arisen the most important public forum in Canada, a center so vivid and universal that for the past 20 years, speakers from every country and nation in the world, men and women representative of every advanced group of thought on all topics of human life, have given their message, have raised the voice of truth and liberalism unafraid and untrammeled. Such is his power. Such are the abiding fruits of a single hour of his mighty presence. His first act, the morning following his arrival, was characteristic of his wonderful love and sympathy, was the healing of a sick child. A wealthy family living opposite had a little daughter of nine who has been an invalid all her life. The mother of this child, also an invalid, was the first to beg Abdul Baha to come and see them inasmuch as they could not go to him. When the message was given to him, he was told of the invalid child and great softness and gravity came into his face. Do you wish me to heal the child, he asked. And as the reply was an ardent appeal, he immediately went to the home of this family. The pale, ethereal little girl with great luminous eyes came into the room and walked straight into those loving outstretched arms and for a moment all was silent. Then pressing her fondly, he exclaimed, This child is not of this world. She is from the kingdom of Abha and has come to the world at this time to be the cause of the guidance and illumination of her family, both in the seen and unseen worlds. From now on throughout all eternity, she is under the protection of Almighty God. Caressingly, he laid his hands upon her head and shoulders and then told the family that she must go out every day, in the middle of the day, on the ground, and that she would be entirely healed. Nine months later, when the master's words had finally taken effect and superseded the instructions of their physicians, as the snows were melting from the ground in early spring, this beautiful child came out of her prison house and walked upon the ground, gradually becoming perfectly healthy strong and well. One morning, Abdul Baha was sitting in his room, overlooking the little garden, on a bleak gray day. He looked out with that far mystic gaze and said, It is cold here, cold and dark. In the land where I come from, it is warm and salubrious. The sun is always shining and the birds are singing. The people of the West have come, and listened attentively to the voice of the Baha'u'llah. 
we have lived in ease and comfort, traveling from place to place after spending 40 years in a Turkish prison. Those were the best days, he exclaimed triumphantly. The days spent in prison were spent in the path of God, in servitude to God. Those were the best days. And then added with deep significance, these days are the fruits of those days. Although Montreal was considered by some a center of religious bigotry, yet he found all the doors open, and he met with the same irresistible response as he had throughout his journey, peoples of all nations, races, and classes flocking to hear him. Nevertheless, we must realize that the power to grasp the significance of his words and the ultimate import of his visit was still in the embryo and that only through the perspective of time are we able to witness the mighty spiritual, moral, and social changes which have already taken place. The last stirring words of Abdu'l-Baha to the people of Canada were in his closing address at St. James Methodist Church. Praise be to God, I find these two great American nations highly capable and advanced in all that appertains to progress and civilization. These governments are fair and equitable. The motives and purposes of these people are lofty and inspiring. You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdu'l-Baha in the West. Welcome to the podcast. It's September now, and Abdu'l-Baha's journey through America would have lasted almost six months by this point. All during this period, the Baha'is in California in the West continued to ask for him to visit their communities. First, however, Abdu'l-Baha wanted to visit a beloved maidservant of the cause, May Maxwell in Montreal, Canada. She was deepened in the faith by Mirza Abdul Fazl and taught many early believers such as Thomas Breakwell. You may remember the story of May and Thomas in a previous podcast we did during our first tour of Europe last year. So much could be said about the service that May and William Sutherland Maxwell performed for the faith. Let's consider their lives now when we listen to a talk by Abdul Baha on capacity. Read by Afnan. 1st September 1912. Talk at the home of Mr. and Mrs. William Sutherland Maxwell. The subject of immortality has been suggested. Life is the expression of composition, and death the expression of decomposition. In the world or kingdom of the minerals, certain materials or elemental substances exist. When through the law of creation they enter into composition, a being or organism comes into existence. For example, certain material atoms are brought together and man is the result. When this composition is destroyed and disintegrated, decomposition takes place. This is mortality or death. When certain elements are composed, an animal comes into being. When these elements are scattered or decomposed, this is called the death of the animal. Again, Certain atoms are bound together by chemical affinity. A composition called a flower appears. When these atoms are dispersed and the composition they have formed is disintegrated, the flower has come to its end. It is dead. Therefore, it is evident that life is the expression of composition and mortality or death is equivalent to decomposition. As the spirit of man is not composed of material elements, it is not subject to decomposition and therefore has no death. It is self-evident that the human spirit is simple, single and not composed in order that it may come to immortality. And it is a philosophical axiom that the individual or indivisible atom is indestructible. At most, it passes through a process of construction and reconstruction. For example, these individual atoms are brought together in a composition and through this composition a given organism, such as a man, an animal, or a plant, is created. When this composition is decomposed, that created organism is brought to an end. 
but the component atoms are not annihilated. They continue to exist because they are single, individual and not composed. Therefore, it may be said that these individual atoms are eternal. Likewise, the human spirit, inasmuch as it is not composed of individual elements or atoms, as it is sanctified about these elements, is eternal. This is a self-evident proof of its immortality. Second, consider the world of dreams, wherein the body of man is immovable, seemingly dead, not subject to sensation. The eyes do not see, the ears do not hear, nor the tongue speak. But the spirit of man is not asleep. It sees, hears, moves, perceives, and discovers realities. Therefore, it is evident that the spirit of man is not affected by the change or condition of the body. Even though the material body should die, the spirit continues eternally alive, just as it exists and functions in the inert body in the realm of dreams. That is to say, the spirit is immortal and will continue its existence after the destruction of the body. Third, the human body has one form. In its composition, it has been transferred from one form to another, but never possesses two forms at the same time. For example, it has existed in the elemental substances of the mineral kingdom. From the mineral kingdom, it has traversed the vegetable kingdom and its constituent substances. From the vegetable kingdom, it has risen by evolution into the kingdom of the animal and from thence attained the kingdom of man. After its disintegration and decomposition, it will return again to the mineral kingdom, leaving its human form and taking a new form unto itself. During these progressions, one form succeeds another, but at no time does the body possess more than one. The spirit of man, however, can manifest itself in all forms at the same time. While it is triangular, it cannot be square, and while it is square, it is not triangular. Similarly, it cannot be spherical and hexagonal at the same time. These various forms or shapes cannot be manifest at the same instant in one material object. Therefore, the form of the physical body of man must be destroyed and abandoned before it can assume or take unto itself another. Mortality, therefore, means transference from one form to another, that is, transference from the human kingdom to the kingdom of the mineral. When the physical man is dead, he will return to dust, and this transference is equivalent to non-existence. But the human spirit in itself contains all these forms, shapes and figures. It is not possible to break or destroy one form so that it may transfer itself into another. As an evidence of this, at the present moment in the human spirit, you have the shape of a square and the figure of a triangle. Simultaneously, also, you can conceive a hexagonal form. All these can be conceived at the same moment in the human spirit, and not one of them needs to be destroyed or broken in order that the spirit of man may be transferred to another. There is no annihilation, no destruction, therefore the human spirit is immortal because it is not transferred from one body into another body. Consider another proof. Every cause is followed by an effect and vice versa. There could be no effect without a cause preceding it. Sight is an effect. There is no doubt that behind that effect there is a cause. When we hear a discourse, there is a speaker. We could not hear words unless they proceeded from the tongue of a speaker. Motion without a mover or cause of motion is inconceivable. Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago. Today we behold his manifest signs. His light is shining. His sovereignty is established. His traces are apparent. His bounties are effulgent. Can we say that Christ did not exist? We can absolutely conclude that Christ existed and that from him these traces proceeded. Still another proof. The body of man becomes lean or fat. It is afflicted with disease, suffers mutilation. Perhaps the eyes become blind, the ears deaf. But none of these imperfections and failings afflict or affect the spirit. The spirit of man remains in the same condition, unchanged. A man is blinded, but his spirit continues the same. He loses his hearing, his hand is cut off, his foot amputated, but his spirit remains the same. He becomes lethargic. He is afflicted with apoplexy, but there is no difference, change or alteration in his spirit. 
This is proof that death is only destruction of the body, while the spirit remains immortal, eternal. Again, all phenomena of the material world are subject to mortality and death, but the immortal spirit does not belong to the phenomenal world. It is holy and sanctified above material existence. If the spirit of man belonged to the elemental existence, the eye could see it, the ear hear it, the hand touch. As long as these five senses cannot perceive it, the proof is unquestioned that it does not belong to the elemental world and therefore is beyond death or mortality, which are inseparable from that material realm of existence. If being is not subject to the limitation of material life, it is not subject to mortality. There are many other proofs of the immortality of the spirit of man. These are but a few of them. Salutations. Now to our roundtable discussion. Hi, I'm Ivan and I'm a filmmaker. Hi, I'm Bahia and I'm studying international development through urban planning. Um, hi, I'm Navo and I studied finance. <laughs> well, there's so many proofs that are considered and defined. But one that really stood out to me was um, how the soul is very much like an atom, in the sense that um, an atom put together with many other atoms creates this organism. And then the organism, when it dies or decomposes, all the atoms separate and become again into the earth or wherever they go. And then they continue to they continue to live. And so they never die. And so like, I felt that was such an example of a physical soil, soul, I guess, which I think is kind of hard to describe, but I thought that that was very interesting. I, I almost felt that, that it was saying that the soul isn't, it isn't bounded by the physical laws that we have in this world. Hmm. Almost like you have the... <laughs> Almost like you have the restrictions that every human body lives and then goes through certain mo mo certain patterns and then eventually disintegrates and passes away, whereas the soul doesn't have those limitations. And in the same way, when it explains how the soul is, and this is what something that's always been very interesting for me to grasp, is the idea that the soul is not actually attached to your body. Mm. So when you get sick and when you get more ill or if you go through gain weight gain or weight loss and all these different phases that a human body goes through the soul doesn't actually aff get affected through that it gets affected by spiritual sicknesses which we see in society it get gets affected by your own spiritual well-being but your your diseases and your physical being don't affect your soul so they're almost like they almost separate from one another and the human body will be born will pa go through this transition of time will go through its own ups and downs and eventually pass away and go disintegrate, disintegrate back into the mineral kingdom, whereas the spirit will pretty much continue through the rest of the worlds of God. I guess I was thinking a lot more about um, explaining the soul. Yeah, that's the part I like, because he, I guess I always thought about, you know, in order to explain or prove spiritual truths, you have to use sort of spiritual examples and, and I don't know, it's... You know, it always sounded like this big philosophical issue that you have to deal with. Whereas Abdul Baha actually just explains it. He explains it by using um, physical examples. He he says, you know, um, especially the immortality of the soul. Um, you know, single elements are not subject to 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 death or destruction, and soul has no no is not a composed element. It's not composed of anything. It's just one soul and therefore it is you know immortal and and therefore it is our spirit and our soul is our are, are, you know bound to live forever and it's a, such a sort of a simple but but profound um proof of our spiritual reality so like every spiritual reality there's a scientific or material example yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah, that, and that that's the, the that's the beauty of where, where you can you know, um, especially if you use it to 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 prove it or to argue it, you actually you know it it, it strikes deeper, it resonates better within us, you know. And I think that's one of the great 
the great factors of the Baha'i faith, of what, what Abdul Baha describes, because you don't have to find you don't have to accept either the science side or the religious side. You don't have to disregard science in order to keep your faith. It's all coherence. So in order to to accept that the soul exists, you believe in the scientific factors of it. You can see the proofs of it in the mineral kingdom, the animal kingdom, the spiritual mm-hmm. kingdom. There's all of these different examples. And it, it's almost like it's saying that, great, so the, the world exists through God, and so does the world of the spirit, and so does the religion. And it's not that you have to find some kind of, um, you have to almost pick a path. Do I believe in science or do I believe in religion? It's a unity between both. As a Baha'i, you don't have to decide. It's, you don't have to kind of disregard every proof the science has in order to hold on to your faith. Having faith means that you accept all the, these other proofs that are around you. When they talk about dreams, and it's always something that I've, I've found very fascinating because people have told me that my dreams don't have a spiritual significance. It's just your mind playing around while you're sleeping. But it's almost saying that when, you're, when your body is still and your senses are all shut off, your spiritual senses are still heightened and are awakened and are able to, I don't know, to have some kind of significance. And I feel like dreams are the one thing that's, not the one thing, the dreams are one of the things that are spiritual manifestations in this world. And you've, it's every night you get to fall asleep and have some kind of experience that's beyond your bodily experiences. Your body gets to rest while your soul continues solving through certain spiritual mysteries or I like to think connects with people who are in the next world and connects with spirits who are kind of around us. So there's this whole idea of are there spirits that are still in this world? Are they communicating with us? And I feel like dreams is this is this link between this world and that world and the soul. And as it says here, when you're sleeping, your body's asleep, but your soul still has this journey exactly yeah yeah i guess i mean the, there's been abdul baha and baha'u'llah both have has spoken a lot have written a lot about dreams actually mm-hmm. um but it's interesting also to use dreams as a, as a sort of a proof of our spiritual side of our, our, our of our nature is is very interesting it's also something that you know people usually don't see coming <laughs> But then I think about those who remember dreams and those who don't remember dreams. And whether or not, maybe we, I think it also is important not to dwell too much on them because, of course, sometimes we can't understand many, many, many things in this world. But I was joking with someone earlier about not being able to understand or, or, or remember one's dreams. And then they said, well, maybe then you're just one person. I was with two people and one person said, uh, maybe because you're just so spiritual that <laughs> <laughs> that you can't remember them. And then another person said that maybe that's because you just you just have no connection whatsoever. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think that dreams are just, yeah, like they're just so profound. And some people have that amazing connection to be able to read them or to have different connect to have a deeper connection and some people don't so it's also important to be moderate in our understanding of dreams so how how do we i guess the question that came to my mind how do we you know after sort of talking about this proof of our spiritual reality um how does that apply to our life how do how does that apply to to things we do in life our interactions with others if you have a plant and you know that one plant is going to give you fruit in one season and then die and never give the fruit again, and you know another plant is, has a potential of giving fruit for the rest of the year and then for the rest of the, the decade and then give fruit for all your family, you're obviously going to pay more attention to the plant that you know is going to live longer and, and take care of you for longer and is going to be something that's more important to your, to your survival and your integral part of your life. And I feel like in the same way, the knowledge that our spirit is immortal and that it's everlasting and that it needs, it, it has this potential to follow through all the future worlds gives us a greater understanding of what's important in this world right now. So we can take care of our body and we can take care of our, um, and we have to take care of our body, but we can follow all these material things and take care of all our material possessions and take care of everything that you have in this world, but you know that you have a maximum of 100 years <laughs> hopefully not 100 years for me, but Hmm. you know that you have a maximum of 100 years where you have these possessions, whereas 
you know that your spirit is going to be with you forever. So it's something that you would naturally want to give more attention to. But I think it's something that because it's it's intangible and it's something that you don't, you're not faced with in every day, it's almost something people feel more willing to disregard. And it's an important reminder that we have for ourselves. But I also think that we have to devote time to understanding our spiritual reality and then in, in doing that act upon it and so that means with interactions that we have with people how can we uplift conversations how can we act upon our soul that is continuously growing and to develop these spiritual capacities and to develop these spiritual attributes and then not give in to the the ills of society like materialism or corruption corruption pre- prejudice prejudice mm-hmm. and to stand back and and not be manipulated by certain problems in t- in today's society and stand back and analyze these these different problems and 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 work with social action towards making a change but i think it's very hard when you're explaining to someone what it means or why you are on a book, go, on a on a pathway that you're on like or what why are you doing children's classes or why are you doing junior youth programs why are you trying to change or transform transform society and i think a lot of people just don't recognize that they have an immortal soul it comes back to this whole concept of inter- instant gratification and it's, it's interesting because it's the same in everything that you look at. If you're a, a woman on a diet and you, you have this long-term understanding that you want to lose weight or that you want to be more healthy, but in that moment when you see that chocolate cake in front of you, you've, you know that eating that chocolate cake right now will make you feel happy right now. But the commitment to, take, to having a diet is a long-term commitment that you don't see the results of. And in the same way for us, going to a party or spending your money on on your own things gives you instant gratification at this moment. But understanding that you're, you're doing an investment for your spirits. And there's consequences. And there's consequences. And this whole I- idea that Abdul Baha presents of cause and effect, it's a material concept. It's not this abstract thing. You, you're very aware that every action that you do take right now will have a spiritual consequence. And will have an effect on your soul, and you can feel it. You can tell that the more you engage in these activities, the more you feel enlightened, the more you feel encouraged to go for it. And it's just a case of one day just switching. Because I think at any point in time, a person can say, I want to go on diet. Or somebody can say, I want to invest in my future, or I want to have an education. In the same way, you can at any point in time switch and say, that's enough. I want to to take care of my soul. I want to invest in my spiritual my spiritual character. I want to uplift the people around me. I want to create a different environment. These are things that are, are going to take time, but in the future it's more worth it to me than to see the instant results of my actions today. And also knowing that like we can attain and we can we can understand our spiritual reality. And that the way through doing that is through service. And if we don't serve, then we won't understand it. But it's also through service and education. That's it for our podcast this week. Special thanks to Sanjel Vreelin for playing May Maxwell, as well as Afnan Kabriri for reading. Also thanks to our roundtable guests, Bahia Marx, Ivan Mihotsi, and Nava Anvari. If you'd like more information about Abdul Baha's travels in the West, visit our site, www.thejourneywest.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at The Journey West. Thanks, everyone. Bye.